Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a guest and the receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. My name is Kelvin Jones. I booked by internet yesterday. Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. Welcome to the Armitage Hotel. Can you spell your first name for me, please? Certainly. K-E-L-V-I-N. Thank you. Do you have your booking number? Or perhaps you printed out your confirmation? Yes, of course. I don't have the printout, but I did remember to note down the number. It's 00 L two three eight one four two zero. Thanks. Double O L two three eight one four two zero. Oh, I see you've stayed with us before. Yes, on several occasions. And do you still have the same vehicle registration number, HQW5919? Well, no. This time I have the company car. And what is the registration number? Oh, dear, I can't remember. Hang on a minute. Here it is on the key ring. HUV331. Thanks. HUV331. Now, today is the 21st of May, and I see you've booked a deluxe room on the fifth floor, room 501. Really? I booked a deluxe room? I usually only ever have a standard double room. It's the off-season, Mr. Jones, and we've upgraded you. How nice. And what does the deluxe room have? Is it as good as a suite? Almost. It has all the usual plus a spa bath, fully stocked bar fridge, a king-size bed, and a balcony. Is there a view from the balcony? Yes. Is that a view of the bay? Yes, and a glimpse of the Blue Lagoon as well. Very nice. I hope it'll be warm enough to sit out there. We can't guarantee the weather, Mr. Jones, although we do try to make your stay as comfortable as possible. Thank you. Now that you mention comfort, is it possible to have some extra pillows, please? I have a sore shoulder, you see, and I need to prop it up at night, or I don't get any sleep. Well, you'll find pillows on the bed, of course, and we can send up a couple more later. Well, I'd appreciate that. One more thing. You paid my credit card over the internet. Can I see your credit card, please? Oh, of course. And some photo ID? What would you like? driver's license. Yes, that's fine. You're staying for five days, is that right? That was the original plan, yes. But the conference has been cut short by two days because the keynote speaker is ill. So I'll be going home on Wednesday. So that's just three nights in all. Afraid so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. The conference is in a building called Chancery Chambers, but I don't have any idea how to get there. Oh, that's the funny-shaped building on the corner of King and Richard Streets. It's quite straightforward, really, and only a few minutes' walk. Look, I'll show you on this map. Good, a map. I like to follow a map if possible. Right. Well, step out the front entrance of the hotel, and you're on Hop Street. Head south on Hop Street towards Gorse Lane, and take the second on the left onto Vicar's Street West. Go all the way down the hill past the Mexican Cafe on your left, the Rebel Hostel on your right, and the big church on the corner of Allen Street. Oh, I think I know the one. It has a huge steeple. Yes, you're right. When you get to the bottom of the hill, you'll have to cross over the main street. What's the name of the main street? Mill Street. Mill Street. Ah, yes, there it is. Cross the main street and continue on to Vicar Street East. There's a big bank next to a bookshop on the corner. Go up the hill towards the entrance to the park. I've heard it's very beautiful. Oh yes, well worth a look when you've got some free time. Anyway, don't go in the park. Turn left into Kitchen Street. You'll walk past Bowen's Bistro. Actually, probably the best place to get a good lunch at a reasonable price. After Bowen's, take the second left into Baker's Lane. It's a very short street. Then take the first on your left onto King Street, and you should see the Art Deco Chancery Chambers building a bit further along. On the corner of Richard Street. Oh, thank you for that. I'm most grateful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a recorded message by an employee of an investment society giving information about savings and investment options. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Welcome to the information line of the State Investment Society. Why would you choose to put your money into an investment society and not a bank? Well, SIS offers everything you'd expect from a bank, but the difference is we're a cooperative. We're one hundred percent owned by our customers, people like you. And that means we always put your best interests first. You won't see our profits going into large foreign-owned finance corporations. No, you'll see them coming back to you and your local community. As a cooperative, we work hard to keep our fees competitive and absolutely minimal. Even better, we can advise you about ways to avoid fees. Here are some suggestions. Firstly. We recommend you carry out as much of your personal banking as possible with us. We won't charge account fees unless your account becomes inactive for some reason. See, no unnecessary fees. Secondly, if you maintain certain minimum account balances, you won't have to pay any transaction charges for transferring money between any accounts that have the same customer number. Although there may be some service charges that apply. Such as the establishment of automatic payments. 
So, how can we help you? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Let's look first at savings options. We can give you three options. Our internet account earns you interest from your very first dollar deposited. You don't have to maintain a minimum balance and you earn a good interest rate from the start. Interest calculated daily and paid into your account monthly. You always have immediate access to your money by using the internet, text or telephone banking. What's more, there are no account or transaction fees. With our Stairs Saver scheme, the more you save, the higher interest you earn. Again, there's no minimum balance, but as your balance grows, you'll earn higher interest rates. There are three interest tiers or steps plus bonus interest. Interest is calculated daily and paid monthly. Now, what about access to your money? You are free to make as many withdrawals as you like. But if you restrict them to one a month and your balance increases over that month, then you'll earn that bonus interest. With our simple saver scheme, access is available anytime and we don't impose penalties for withdrawals. This scheme has one interest rate no minimum balance, and interest is calculated daily and paid annually at the end of the financial year, the 30th of June. So, you can see that savings accounts are ideal if you're starting from scratch. Do you know you can open a savings account with as little as $10? They're usually the best choice for short-term financial goals. For the longer term, we recommend some kind of investment account. Let's take a look at our investment options, starting with the safest. The most secure, low-risk option is a basic term deposit, starting with a minimum deposit of $1,000. Interest is calculated daily, but you can choose whether to have it paid out monthly, quarterly, or at maturity. What we recommend, if you really want to see money grow, is having interest compounded quarterly. You'll only get access to your funds when your term deposit matures, so be sure to think carefully about the amount of time before you lock it away. It could be anything from six months to five years. Bonds are generally a longer commitment, but they may bring better rewards in the future. There is a minimum deposit of $5,000 and interest is calculated daily. You may choose to have interest compounded quarterly or paid out quarterly. And, of course, you'll have access to your money when your bond reaches maturity. Looking really long term, there is our retirement fund, which is, of course, a savings plan for retirement. There is no minimum deposit, but the good news is that you can choose to contribute a certain percentage of your income before tax is paid on it. As for interest, well, you choose a particular type of fund which has a different level of return depending on the level of risk. And access? Well, not before you turn 60 years old. As I said, it's a retirement scheme. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a tutor discussing with two students 
their research for a paper in cyber psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'm very glad that the two of you decided to pursue this research topic because I think it's not only much needed but very relevant to current psychological concerns about addiction issues in young people. Now, tell me, how did you get started? Well, we looked around for problems or perceived problems that teenagers in general might encounter, and we came up with the extremely popular phenomenon of instant messaging and the implications that the use or overuse of this form of communication might have on teen behaviour. Then we decided to propose the concept of instant messaging addiction. By the way, do you mind if we abbreviate instant messaging to I am in our discussion? Not at all. But before you go any further, tell me something about the demographic sample you used. We chose a random sample of teenagers from Jiangsu province from a typical public middle school, and we considered this group to be representative of teenagers in urban China. We distributed 500 questionnaires and 450 were returned. The sample group was on average aged between 14 and 15 years. Internet addiction, or technological addiction as it's sometimes called, has been studied many times before. What makes your research different? Well, previous studies indicated that internet-dependent students are more likely to use instant communication, but we wanted to find out primarily whether IM addiction actually exists, and if so, what the symptoms are. And secondly, we wanted to know whether I am addiction could be predicted. And finally, whether addiction has an impact on academic performance. Quite a large undertaking. Tell me, what I am addiction symptoms did you identify among teenagers in your sample? We found four major I am addiction symptoms, which are remarkably similar to the symptoms used to identify substance dependence although here we're looking at behavioural addiction, not chemical addiction to drugs, alcohol or the like. Yes, loss of control was a significant factor, which indicates that the addicts had less self-discipline. They could not control the amount of time they spent on IM, and they neglected their schoolwork, as well as other responsibilities or obligations they might have. Obviously, Academic performance was adversely affected. I'm sure that led to a lot of complaints from family and friends, not to mention teachers. Yes, of course. Another symptom was, as you would expect, a preoccupation with instant messaging. They would be annoyed if interrupted when chatting online, and they would feel depressed and moody when they couldn't. They would go without sleep in order to chat. And when they were offline, they would still be thinking about online chatting. As in chemical addiction, they would need to increase the dose, in this case of IM time, to get satisfaction. That sounds quite disturbing. Yes, and as you can imagine, loss of relationships due to overuse of IM was a factor too. The addicted teenagers would rather chat online than go out with friends or spend time with family, which jeopardised their social relationships and their educational opportunities. The fourth addictive factor we found was escape. These teenagers used IM as a form of escape from reality and responsibilities. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. And can IM addiction be predicted? Well, we found a definite correlation between shyness and IM addiction. Not only shyness, but also a feeling of alienation was a predictor too. Alienation from family, peers, and school. So the more alienated they feel, the more they look for affection, friendship, and social support through IM. Exactly. But interestingly, what we found was that alienation was a predictor for addiction, but not necessarily related to a high level of IM use. How do you explain that? One possible explanation we considered was that those who were not alienated would communicate frequently with their friends through IM, but addicts, on the other hand. Are probably looking for friendship through online chatting with strangers. Look, we're just about out of time. I'm really looking forward to reading your paper when you've finished it. But before I go, can you quickly sum up your conclusions? By looking at behavioural patterns and psychological characteristics, we were able to establish that there is a difference between high level of IM use and IM addiction as such. And that there are certain positive predictors for addiction, and our findings showed that teenagers' level of use of IM affected their academic performance. So you're saying that IM addiction detracts from the student's academic performance? That's what we set out to prove, and there's absolutely no doubt. Addicted students perform badly at school, but what we also found. Is that there is a correlation between the level of IM use and schoolwork? So not just the addicts suffer low scores. Precisely, our results show that the higher the level of IM use, regardless of whether addiction is involved, the more negative impact there is on academic performance. Your research shows then that not only should teachers and parents. Be on the lookout for those teenagers who might be vulnerable to IM addiction, but that parents should pay close attention and provide proper guidance and monitor their teenagers' level of use of instant messaging. Yes, that's it in a nutshell. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a geography lecture on the British Isles. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, I'm glad so many of you have turned out to hear what I have to say today about the British Isles, that area of the Eastern Atlantic that we Americans find so confusing. I'm afraid just looking at a map or a page in the atlas doesn't necessarily explain the geographic terminology. In referring to the British Isles. A word of apology for those of you of Irish descent, that is, those whose ancestors come from Ire, the Republic of Ireland. No matter how geographically accurate the place names that I use today are, some of you will be understandably upset to be included in anything termed British. I have a very useful image that might help you differentiate between the various labels that distinguish the political and geographic reality. Of the so-called British Isles, I want to show you a Venn diagram 
which is a mathematical illustration that shows all the possible relationships between sets. Look at this Venn diagram, and you will see that the geographical terminology is in bold, while the political terms are in italics. See here the British Isles in bold and the British Islands in italics. The aim of this lecture is to explain the meanings of and relationships among those terms. In geographical terms, you will see that the British Isles is an archipelago made up of the two large islands of Great Britain and Ireland, and including many smaller surrounding islands. Of course, you can't tell from the Venn diagram. The true comparative size of these islands. You'll need to look at the map for that. But take my word for it: Great Britain is the largest island of the archipelago, followed by Ireland, which, in reality, geographically, lies to the west, and there are over a thousand smaller islands. Now, in political terms, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Is the constitutional monarchy, which includes the island of Great Britain, some small nearby islands, although not the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, and the northeastern part of the island of Ireland. Thank goodness it is generally shortened to United Kingdom, the UK, Great Britain, or Britain, or even the abbreviation GB, although none of these are strictly correct, of course. You'd better listen carefully to the next part, because I warn you, it is very confusing. Ireland is the name of the sovereign republic occupying the larger part of the island of Ireland, but to distinguish it from the name of the island itself, and most importantly from the other part which belongs to the UK, it is called the Republic of Ireland, or its Irish language name, Ire. That's E I R E, even though Ire directly translates as Ireland. The smaller portion of the island is called Northern Ireland. The partition of Ireland took place in 1922 after a great history of struggle that we won't go into here. England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are legal jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, but Great Britain. Refers to the countries of England, Wales, and Scotland as a unit. The British Islands contain the United Kingdom, the Channel Islands, made up of Guernsey and Jersey, and Isle of Man, which all have the British monarch as head of state. Interestingly, the Isle of Man, although governed as a British Crown dependency, has its own parliament. But relies on the UK for defence and in matters of external relations. So, you've learnt something about the geographical and political confusion surrounding the British Isles. Let's have a look at some of the linguistic confusion. To start with, there isn't an adjective to refer to the United Kingdom, so the term British is generally used. However, that means that citizens of Northern Ireland. Although not on the island of Great Britain, still describe themselves as British because this reflects their political and cultural identity. Irish, in a political sense, refers to the Republic only. So sometimes citizens of Northern Ireland would call themselves Northern Irish as a point of difference. Of course, the Northern in Northern Irish is not completely accurate either, as the most northerly peninsula on the island. Is in the county of Donegal, which is part of the republic. Okay, we might get in a muddle over the term Irish, but at least Scottish, Welsh, and English should be self-explanatory. Apparently not to us Americans, and Europeans are often guilty of this too. We often use the term English incorrectly to mean British. I'd have to be the first to admit to calling my Welsh colleague English, which really gets his heckles up. He is Welsh, he tells me, and he may also be British, but he is definitely not English. Just one more thing: what is the British Commonwealth? It's a voluntary association of independent states 
many of which were former British colonies. In fact, what was primarily the old British Empire. However, it's no longer known as the British Commonwealth, but is now called the Commonwealth of Nations instead, presumably because current members do not want to remember the old colonial ties. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So, guys, don't forget like, subscribe, and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking. You got guesswork. Please, guys, participate in every day new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.